welcome. I'm Ann Sumner and I have the privilege of working in the Asset Management Division for Baker Boyer Bank. Today I also have the privilege of talking with four area physicians with a combined over 100 years of medical experience between them all about COVID and COVID vaccines and how it relates to our community and our region. We have with us today Dr. Kaminsky, who currently serves as the public health officer for Walla Walla. He had a career as a local OBGYN physician and retired and ran straight into public health during a pandemic. We also have Dr. Hall, who is the chief medical officer at Providence here in Walla Walla, Providence St. Mary's. Dr. Hall has practiced medicine since 2001. We have Dr. Isaacs. He's the regional Medi medical director for neuroscience at Providence in Spokane and has 44 years of medical experience. Finally, we have Dr. Eric Yahuyainen, also known as Dr. J, who recently retired after 23 years at Walla Walla Clinic. He um, spent the last 15 years in the urgent care department, which has a heavy volume of infectious disease. If you want more information on the scientific parts about the vaccine, we have provided a link below that you can watch a YouTube video and get really into the weeds about COVID vaccine. Dr. Kaminsky, maybe you can start us off by telling us how the, the COVID vaccine clinics are going here in Walla Walla. Um, they're going very, very well. Um, so, um, we think we've, we, you know, we, we started we started the process through the hospital system through Providence, and we first reached all the healthcare providers, and and the, and the Providence was very generous to open up that space and their personnel to allow that to happen. <clears throat> As we were starting to get into the community, the one B one community, speaking with our partners in the community, we felt like we needed to have the mass vaccination site, and um, since. Uh, we were supposed to go live on February 1, but we actually went live on, I think, January 23rd, I think was the first clinic. And, um, and since, that, since that time, we've had approximately eight or so mass vaccination clinics. And we've been able to deliver um, up to 1,800 doses in a given day. Um, we, we think we still have even more capacity than that, um, it is a Herculean effort that is community wide. I mean, we have, you know, each event requires about 300 um, volunteers. Um, so we've, we've, we've done well enough that we have people actually coming from other counties and you may have um, seen the recent newspaper article, but about 25% of our appointments from yesterday were from out of Walla Walla County. So um, we've had big success and it's been a good community building um, uh, event for us. It's bringing a lot of people together to, um, to fight this, this common, fight together for this common goal. Yeah, thank you. Do you Dr. Hall, how has it been going at, at Providence with staff being vaccinated? Um, I think it's going really well. I think we've we're starting to come up on around um, two thirds of our staff have had at least one vaccine with most of those having two vaccines. And over the last few weeks, we've seen that um, our number of uh, caregivers that go out for an illness, for any illness, go down dramatically. So we've seen our own staff <clears throat> have, have their um, uh, attendances much improved and a lot less folks are getting sick. Um, and so we're probably the organization with the most people, the earliest that got their vaccine series completed. Um, hopefully that that spells good things for the future for the rest of the community. Dr. Kaminsky, how many vaccines altogether have been um, put into arms in the community? Do you know? Um, there is a the, the uh, Department of Health has a dashboard. And it does have a running running tally, mm -hmm. and uh, what it does not include is the penitentiary, the VA, a long-term care facility. I don't think it includes everything, 
but um, we've given out somewhere around 10,000 um, doses, and that's kind of a ballpark figure. I don't have the exact number, um, but we think we've um, we've just about saturated the demand up to the 1B1 group. So we're hoping we can move forward with the next group now that we our demand is starting to decrease for the the current group, the current cohort. But you can check the website for the exact number. Okay, I was looking for it the other day, and or, and uh, I couldn't find the exact, so I had to get it straight from the horse's mouth here. So I'm a big picture guy. And and if you have about ten thousand shots, you know, in the community at large, that probably represents about maybe seven thousand different vaccinees, you know, somewhere in that vicinity, because a lot of these are second shots. Um, yeah, I think I think there's probably six to seven thousand. Prime, primary doses and the rest of them are are the booster doses. Sure. But we you know we, we delivered four thousand doses um, Sunday uh, Saturday Sunday Monday, yeah. almost four thousand doses. So we our efficiency is increasing. Wow, I think that vaccines are one way. The goal, of course, is to get back to whatever our new normal is as quickly as possible. And part of um, getting vaccines in arms is busting myths that might be keeping people from um, accepting the vaccine or wanting to get the vaccine. So maybe you could all talk about what some of those misconceptions are about the vaccine and um, help educate us on those. I'd like yeah, to start. I, I thought Dr. Yahya and his information, he's going to really enlighten all of us in our community. So take it away, Dr. Yahian. And well, the biggest hesitation that we've seen is that people saying, oh, this was rushed. I don't know. We, we don't know if it's going to work. We don't know if it's safe. It was rushed. And the the term for the development of the vaccine, Oper Operation Warp Speed, probably was not a good choice of terms. It should have been something like Operation Breakthrough or something like that. The, the, the reality is, is that the development of RNA vaccines has been ongoing a long, long time. This could not have developed so rapidly if it hadn't been built on decades worth of experience and experimentation, starting with the very first um, little RNA pieces that were put into uh, mice back in about 1990, and they showed that they elicited an immune response, and there were experiments through the 1990s. They they really started accelerating uh, somewhere around nine, uh, 2009, 2010, however. The big problem during that interim period was we knew that we could, that RNA would induce a, a, a really potent immune response, but how do you make it pure? How do you get exactly the pieces that you want? How do you um, manufacture large amounts of it then how do you protect the, it from being destroyed by your immune system? So your body has what are called RNAs. If you just inject this RNA into the body, boom, it's gone. Your body knows how to get rid of it. So the experiments in putting kind of a fatty coat on it, which is similar to the coat on a lot of our cells, really started in earnest somewhere around 2011, 2012, and that's when they, they started producing some pretty interesting articles showing, ah, we can protect this stuff by by putting this coat around it. And that, that has accelerated over recent years. And the initial experiments were done with influenza, Zika virus, all these other things. Um, and, and finally, of course, when this hit, and on January 11th, the 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 genetic code for this virus was published online right away people who had already been working on vaccines and already working on this technology said ah we think we know what to do here because that little spike protein was identified as a target for a possible vaccine in 2002 with the first SARS epidemic this was the biggest problem that we're having is people feel this was rushed it was too fast it's new it is new technology for for mass vaccinations but it built upon decades of experience and experimentation otherwise it could not have happened that's the the amazing thing about this so operation warp speed kind of a bad term 
I, I would think Operation Breakthrough, something like that, because this is an amazing, amazing technology and the results are have been truly stunning. Wow. CN, you need to be on CNN, Dr. Yahyanin. You're good. <laughs> I don't know. So one of the questions people have been asking is, OK, well, how do we know the vaccinations are going to do any good? We have a lot of data from the early studies. This they were able to produce kind of experimental vaccines for this back in mid March. They first went into animals, then into small numbers of humans, and then by mid July, large numbers of humans. So the studies finally that were published in December had over 70,000 people, half of whom got fake vaccines, half of whom got the real thing. And then you started monitoring them weekly for weeks to find out what happened. Well, we know what happened. There was 20 times a decreased rate. No, no, sorry. Yeah, uh, about 94, 95% in uh, protection against serious infection and 99% protection against death. Nobody in the vaccinated group died. Yeah. So, and I think to that one, point, we've really seen, um, you know, probably 60% of our admissions come from the immediate Walla Walla County or the counties around us. And um, we get a few transfers from outside the area, but for the most part, our admissions come from right inside of Walla Walla or like Columbia County or maybe Pendleton or LaGrande. I mean, pretty close to us. And um, now that I think we have a, a majority of like our um, nursing home patients vaccinated or uh, folks in senior living, we've really seen our admissions have really tapered off. And that's, you know, the older age group, probably 70 years and up is a majority of our hospitalizations. Um, and we've seen hospitalizations drop by very large numbers, 60, 70% in the last um, you know month or so. So that, I think that supports that, Dr. Yeah, and can, can I prompt Dr. Isaacs? I can see his brain, his, his gears turning. Um, so one of the concerns I have is that, you know, once we get through this 1B1 group, we're really vaccinating the, the, the vulnerable people. So we're going to see decreased hospitalizations, decreased deaths. And, and I can see that the uh, the tenor in the community is, is going to change to where people like, why, why should I get a vaccine? So I didn't give you much uh, leeway, Dr. Isaacs, nope. but why, why would, why would anyone want to get a vaccine if, uh, if they're not going to die from this disease or get severe sure. illness? I think there's still a couple of very important reasons. One is that as we have all heard, uh, there are the mutant viruses that are spreading. The mutant viruses uh, can be both more contagious and um, could be, depending on what happens, uh, more lethal. Uh, so th that if you were an individual or you have a family or uh, just part of the community, you want to reduce the risk of, of spreading of those viruses as they come forth. Uh, and that will also uh, complete this job. The, the vaccines make such a more robust response than even the natural infection. And so even if you've had an infection, uh, you still want to get immunized because that will protect you, your family, your community from uh, whatever is going to be coming down the, the line. And we don't really know that. Uh, what we do see is that the predominance of vaccine strain, looks to be virus strain coming through Washington state is likely to be one of these mutants very shortly. So it's a matter of getting ahead of, uh, of the game protecting all of ourselves and our families uh, as we uh, need to need to use the vaccines vaccines to it. And as uh, Dr. Yahyanin was saying, absolutely, um, these things seem to be 100% effective for serious illness that is in death. Uh, um, that's impressive. Um, so they're safe. I think we can see that. So people don't have to worry uh, about that. Uh, it doesn't change your DNA in your body. Uh, it doesn't uh, have any uh, lasting effects. The studies with all vaccines have shown that if there are going to be longer term effects, they, they show up within two months. So we've had a lot of experience already to see that uh, these vaccines do not have long term effects. 
They don't have unusual short-term effects. They have the local effects in the arm, the soreness, sometimes a little fever and so forth, but there's no downside to getting the vaccination. And there's only upside uh, for your family, yourself and your community. So it's really a plus to go ahead and get them even at this time. Yeah. And it should be noted that even though the, the mortality rates for this are substantially lower than for some of the previous coronaviruses, coronaviruses have potential to be much more deadly. So I am concerned about more spread and more uh, genetic variation in these things. The, the first SARS epidemic, 2002, killed 10% of the people who got it. This, the MERS epidemic, which was coronavirus, went from bats to camels to humans, uh, killed 30% of the people who got it. So, you know, the more we can tamp this down and prevent spread and prevent that kind of genetic variation, the better off we are. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. We were very lucky, in fact, that even though this has been distressing and obviously severe and we've lost 500,000 Americans to it, we're lucky that it wasn't a more contagious virus variant and or a more lethal one. Either one of those would have just changed this whole equation from where we stand now um, to, to a much more severe degree. And maybe Dr. Isaacs and Dr. Yahannon, you know, so t time. So let's say that everyone stopped vaccinating. Once we get done with this group that's highly motivated and people stop getting vaccinated, you talked about the variants. Can you just briefly discuss, like, what's the effect of time if we allow these variants to be out there with a lot of susceptible people? What, what, how would that scenario unfold? Well, let, let me just take a quick stab. You know, the, the, Obviously, when you, when you have one of these viruses uh, and you have the infection, you're making you know, millions, billions of viral particles. And each time it reproduces, it has a chance of becoming a mutant. And you have millions of people in the world that are getting them. So you have an enormous opportunity to, to select the viral particles uh, that are more infectious and, and more, uh, more damaging. Um, so the time frame that we have is right now we, we're as you were just saying we have a lull more or less not a lull but we're seeing the 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 numbers come down this is that opportunity to really get control of it and really uh, not only in the u.s but around the world because if we do it in the u.s that's great but if you have other countries where you have uh, millions of people who aren't immunized then that can come back as a more potent strain uh, to our country as well as affecting their country. So we really need to move quickly. So, well, I'm, I'm not sure I can really add much to what, what Ken has said regarding that. I, you know, in terms of addressing people's hesitancy, um, they have to know how ridiculously pure this process is compared to a typical influenza vaccine. You know, in with flu, you go around several months ahead of time and you, and you make a guess at which flu strains are going to be widespread and you grow them in, you grow these flu particles in eggs or in other tissue lines and then you collect them, then try to purify them. And it's got this big kind of a soup full of genetic material. And of course they check it for safety, but this is so different. This is a little piece of RNA that is very much like RNA that your cells see all the time. In fact, they had to try to mimic that little piece of RNA, put the same kind of little tail and cap on it, just like your, your RNA has. And it's just that little piece of material. It never goes into the central part, the control center of your cells, the nucleus. It can't cause genetic mutations. And I think it's scary for people to think about this other genetic material being injected all vaccines work by introducing some genetic material that your body can fight that's how we got rid of smallpox which killed 300 million people in the 20 in the 20th century um, so this is just a major breakthrough it's incredibly pure the side effects are very very low and the effectiveness is just astoundingly better than say a typical seasonal flu vaccine and i, I don't think part. oh go ahead Dr. Another beautiful part of this mRNA vaccine 
is that if we do get mutants uh, that are more potent, uh, they can uh, reprogram the vaccine very quickly and ramp up. Whereas with the flu, for example, as uh, Eric was saying, that you have to kind of plan for the next year and you have to ramp up all of this production. Uh, with the mRNA viruses uh, vaccine, you can just ramp up within two weeks. Uh, FDA is all behind it and uh, you, can, you can match it. Um, you don't want to have to do that, but it's, it's one of the beauties of the mRNA uh, vaccines. And I don't think we can say yet that our drop off in hospitalizations is directly related to the vaccine, but it does seem like we're getting less admissions from the most vulnerable communities, which are our, um, very advanced in age uh, elderly folks. Um, but certainly we've seen fewer transfers from nursing homes and assisted living and that type of thing. And I do think in the future we're going to see more of these mRNA vaccines because I think they're very, very, very safe. Honestly, though, my wife is a little disappointed that uh, it wasn't going to fix my DNA or make me better. So <laughs> I think that part, she was a little bummed out. <clears throat> I told her I wasn't going to change my DNA very much, and she, she, was, yeah. she had higher hopes than that <laughs> for the vaccine. Uh, doctor, doctors, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm adding you to the expert panel, Dr. Hall. Uh, but I, can someone comment on, you know, the herd immunity and the different ways to get to herd immunity, and also thinking about those variants and what happens to the reproduction rate of the virus um, that may highlight the need to act with speed on vaccinating. Um, can someone talk about herd immunity and what, what you think that magic number is? And, and then I can kind of comment on what we're seeing uh, in the community with uh, the, the acceptance rate of the vaccine. At, actually, I'll start with that. I, I think in the, in the healthcare sector and the 1B1 group, I'm just going to kind of ballpark it. We're seeing probably around somewhere around 60, 70 percent. I would say closer to 70 percent um, uh, acceptance rate for the vaccine. But as we get to these other groups that are potentially lower risk, we're probably going to see less uh, adoption of the vaccine. So with that, what, what, do you, what is the magic number for herd immunity and what are the implications um, if we do and don't get there? I can, I can take a shot at this. The best numbers I've heard are 70 to 80% immune from a combination of either infection or vaccination. We have a, we're all eyes are going to be on Israel in the next month because they initially managed the pandemic extremely badly. They had very high rates. They shut down their country kind of twice in the second time in 2019. They had a real high spikes during, during the winter season. And uh, they made a deal with Pfizer to give them lots and lots of vaccines. And they started vaccinating aggressively. Um, so Israel has 9 million people, about 2 million more than the state of Washington. They were running rates of about 4,000 infections a day at their peak. They aggressively started vaccinating. By the beginning of February, they had vaccinated over 80% of people 60 and older. So what happened to their hospitalization and mortality rates? They dropped 99%. I mean, that's stunning. By now, near the end of February, they vaccinated at least 50% of the entire population and the, about 90% of those who are in a higher risk groups. So they're starting to open up their businesses now after everything being shut down. They had a horrendous December and January. They went gung-ho and vaccinated more aggressively than any country in the world. And they had a massive drop off in hospitalization and fatalities and we're all eyes now are going to be on them because they're they're leading the way and if, if we want to know what we need to do you know to to open up and to restart businesses and to be safely together you take a look at what israel's doing and let's see what happens with them over the next four to six weeks that was beautiful but you didn't answer the question what's so the we're question? moving on to doctor we're moving on to dr isaacs <laughs> herd immunity <laughs> Uh, what's the number? Uh, and you're, I think you're muted, Dr. Isaac. 
I yeah, said so, that, it, it, 70 so, to 80 percent likely. Yeah, and this, <laughs> The 70 to 80 percent number is, is what uh, I think has been quite widely circulated in terms of the kind of the transmission uh, uh, reduction that, that's needed to, to pre herd immunity. One of the aspects, though, is that that isn't all, as you know, from immunization. That is, you don't necessarily need to exactly get to 70 to 80 percent people with the immunization, though the immunization is a more robust way. Uh, there is a, a large number of people who have been, had asymptomatic infections uh, as well, and th th that contributes. And so you don't really know uh, exactly the number that have already had some immunity developed by mild or asymptomatic infections. Uh, it appears to be, you know, a significant amount. So between uh, between immunizations, making it a, a more robust response, and the, the number of people that have had either mild or asymptomatic or previously infected. Um, the, the hope is, uh, as Dr. Yahya was saying, we should get there. Um, well, just when is not clear, but hopefully in the next few months. But, you, you know, each, uh, this is one of those things, I think the example is, you you're, you want to drive over to Seattle in the winter, and you're going to go over the pass. Um, the weather's changing. You don't know where it's going to be exactly in a few hours. You don't know with this uh, uh, infection where it's going to be in a few weeks or a few uh, in a month or two. We, uh, so you have to continually be on your guard and being prepared for what either may be great news or what may be very concerning news. Um, I think that's why we continue to encourage everyone to to pay close attention and for businesses get the immunization. There's a great a great website. I mean, not only is the county health department, uh, thanks you, uh, uh, doing has a great website. CDC has a great website for all the different businesses because different businesses have different criteria that they need to be attentive to uh, for for this work. Um, Anne, are you going to be insulted if I ask some more questions? I'm not going to be insulted at all. Go for okay. it, Dr. Minsky. So I, I, was, I was just reviewing your questions before this meeting, and, and um, one of the questions was um, in, infectivity after the vaccine, mm -hmm. and um, should I wear a mask after the vaccine? Mm -hmm. So I'm going to throw that out there on the floor for whoever wants to pick that up. The infectivity, you know, the the impressive part about the vaccines, and I think this is true for uh, Pfizer and Moderna, which is what we have currently in our community, almost all of it's Pfizer, but there's a little bit of Moderna, is that the infectivity, even in the mutant strains, is is really good, meaning it's a very low um, reinfectivity rate. I think some studies have said less than 1% so far. I think everybody's watching and waiting carefully these, these variants, and there's more studies ongoing. Um, I'll leave your second question, though, for somebody else there, Jake. And Chris, you were talking about reinfectivity of the number of people who get a second infection. Correct. After the first yeah. infection and they get a vaccine, how likely are they to get a second infection? I think yeah. that number is very low. That's what our understanding is, too. I think the other question, though, is if you get the vaccine, uh, it doesn't stop you from getting the viral illness. It means that you do not get the severe one. And as has been said, you, there's been no one who has, once you have it, that has died from it. So uh, from, not from the illness. So it's very powerful in reducing severe illness mm -hmm. and death. But still people can get mild infection and still people theoretically can be contagious uh, after having the vaccination. Um, we know already that people with mild or asymptomatic illness can still be infected, even if they're not coughing and sneezing and so forth. I'd be interested in what uh, Eric says about the uh, number of people, uh, you know, that the contagiousness afterwards, after that if you do have a mild infection or asymptomatic having had the vaccination. Again, as, as Chris said, the, the, the percentage of people who actually could get another symptomatic infection is, is quite low. Um, but uh, how many people could get it, get some virus, have it be kind of colonized in their throat or their nose 
for a few days while their immune system gets rid of it and then spread it to others. That is unknown at this point. And it, it, we're exposed to germs all the time that they we inhale them, that maybe our immune system is revved up to fight that. Otherwise, we'd be sick all the time, right? Um, you, you inhale it, it stays there for a few days, you get rid of it. Um, the sicker you are, and the, the more likely you are to be contagious for a longer period of time. And that's that's been known since February of last year when they started checking for active virus in people who were hospitalized in China. They, they did some pretty amazing testing and the people who were sicker were more contagious for a longer period of time. But, you know, it is entirely possible to have this virus settling in your nose. You don't feel sick at all. It's colonized air for a little while. You get rid of it, but you can pass it on to somebody else. We just don't know the exact numbers. Uh, one of the things I'm concerned about is people feeling like, oh, I've been vaccinated. I don't have to wear a mask. I think we need, for the time being, a culture of mask wearing, even if you know that your chance of getting something is, is low. It, it sends out bad signals. And then you have people who are anti-vaccine who are also anti-mask who say, oh, they're not wearing masks. All these people, you know, I'm just going to run around. I, I think that sets a bad precedent. Until we know that our community transmission here is, in, is really, really low, we just all need to be vigilant with that kind of thing. So with that said, you know, the, one of the questions that Anne presented was, well, well then when, when can we, when is it quote unquote safe to go back to work? Can anyone comment on that? And what, and what does that look like? What kind of precautions should we do? You know, you know um, I'm going to suggest that different businesses who may be interested in this actually do visit the CDC website. The CDC website, if you just put in, uh, you know, CDC uh, business and so forth, gets you to it because there's a big difference of when uh, a logger can go back to work in the woods and uh, somebody can uh, go back to work when they're very closely in touch with somebody, a dental assistant or a, a primary health care provider. So um, uh, as uh, businesses consider this, um, they've got to look not only at the, the CDC, that's a good place, um, the OSHA, and of course, uh, state rules and regulations on that, but it's going to vary highly uh, dependent upon exactly your risk of exposure to people, uh, how long, how frequently, how close. Hmm. I want a better answer than that. Someone, I want, I want, to, like, I want to know exactly when it's. Um, we're going to be June wearing masks 20, for a while. June twenty second. <laughs> what year? Uh, you know, I think we're talking about opening. Um, protection of your employees and the people who work there, that's one. And then we're also talking about protection of people who are using your business, right? So that you don't become a, you know, your your bank or your restaurant doesn't become a super spreader site or something. So, so your employee protection, you know, a lot of people are using incentives to try to get their employees vaccinated. And that may be something like, you know, throwing a party once you've got 80% of your employees vaccinated, or it may be giving them a $100 bill. I mean, there are ways to do this. And a lot of uh, around the world, people are, are doing that. They're, you know, trying to get young people vaccinated. So they're throwing parties. Or I, I read about one place where there's like free food, you know, at the vaccination center. Um, so there's there are ways you want to encourage your employees to get vaccinated at a very, very high rate. Um, that's, that's one thing the, the, you know, the other things that people have to look at are, you know, obviously breathing the same air. So what's your ventilation like, you know, are we going to have to think about real high, um, quality filters on all of our ventilation and heating systems now, uh, every airline now has HEPA filters and in, they don't recirculate the air as often. It goes top to bottom, it goes through a HEPA filter, which is able to filter out that uh, virus. Um, there's a there are a lot of there's a lot of technology, and there and there are a lot of there are, there are online guidance 
if your business wants to invest in new ventilation, um, and then there's of course practical things like cleaning heavily used surfaces, spacing people out, that kind of thing. But um, you know, well, I'm not sure I have any more. I'm not sure so I can answer. Basic, make yeah, these ba these basic things like the distancing, the hand washing, the masking. Maybe someone can comment on like how, how really how effective is that? Because some businesses in the community they can't buy a new HVAC system. You know, they can do they can do the washing of the counters and whatnot. So can someone just kind of comment on what's the potency and the effectiveness of just the distancing and the hand washing and the and the masking? Well, we know from the the big studies that have been done, you know, wearing a mask, washing your hands frequently, cleaning your surfaces frequently. You know, a lot of us have been essential workers, everybody from physicians and nurses, though, to grocery workers and sanitation workers. And even though this um, disease has affected a lot of people, it hasn't affected everyone. So we know that being compliant with masking, as much as everybody hates it, I mean, I don't think anybody likes it. My kids say that I look better in a mask, but I'm probably about the only one. <laughs> I, By the way, uh, Eric, to your point, I've been telling them that the reason why the windows are out of the high school buildings is that's the new ventilation program. So it's like, if you don't have any <laughs> windows, you got good air. But um, I don't, I'm waiting for them to catch on to it. But I, but I do think, um, as far as how this goes, I do think we could be for some time having to deal with masking and hand washing and cleaning our server. We probably all learned a lesson about how dirty our phones are. I mean, probably before this started, probably people clean their phone like once a year when they got a new case. Now most of us clean it daily or more often, um, depending on your level of carefulness. And um, I think if we want to get back to business and we want businesses to open, we need to normalize some of these really important safety precautions. So we need to normalize wearing a mask, washing our hands, you know, thinking of each other more than ourselves. Um, and I, I think that'll help a lot. I also think a lot of it depends on um, you know, the Department of Health, like how much vaccine we're able to get into arms and how quickly we're able to do it. If we can get a majority of the population, you know, vaccinated by early summer, and certainly Walla Walla County has been probably one of the more effective and efficient counties for getting vaccines into arms, um, then, and we're, honestly, we're probably being held back a little bit by the state as far as who we can vaccinate next, which is frustrating to a lot of us. But if we can get vaccines into arms by early summer, I think a lot of businesses can safely reopen um, and get back to things and keep their both their employees safe and their customers safe. Do we do we need to get to herd immunity before opening up business? I think we all like to see herd immunity um, beforehand. I think a lot depends on these new variants and how much they come up. I mean, the, the advantage of getting to herd immunity is you should start to decrease the number of mutant strains that come along. Um, so I think that's one big thing. And I think uh, Eric's right looking at some of these countries that are able to get to herd immunity before us, we're gonna learn if that's effective or not. And I don't think anyone truly knows the incidence of the real infection right now. I think that's not been published. I know it's high. I know it's higher higher than we think it's it's been, um, but I don't think we know that number yet. And Jake, also on, on the opening the businesses, again, I, I think we all realize we've gotten through gone through something that's really extraordinary and that uh, you kind of don't expect businesses to quite open necessarily the same way. So businesses that do have um, uh, flexible hours or, or have remote workers, I mean, uh, and you, that where you can be remote, you use that. All of those allow you to, uh, to start the business uh, further, but it's not likely to be exactly the way it used to be. We're going to have a new thing. We're going to be separated. You're going to not feel comfortable standing in line with a, a whole bunch of people at the same time. You're going to want to limit all of those things. So we're going to go through it. Uh, we're going to have an evolution of how we all behave. And part of that with businesses is what allows them to open and do business earlier too. Mm -hmm. and, and so the start of that question was, was I was thinking, you know, we're in phase two right now with regards to opening up the businesses and phase three is, is probably will be announced in within the month of what that what that means. And so I guess my the core of my question was for the businesses in our community. If they did those basic things, you know, even if we didn't get even if we, even if we weren't at herd immunity and uh, either through vaccinations or wild type infection, 
do those basic do those basic measures are they are they effective? They're they're effective, but are they effective enough? Is is really the the issue? I um, regarding the number of people who actually have had coronavirus. I actually reviewed this recently. The CDC thinks that we've got we've had how many documented cases in the U.S. twenty two million, twenty seven million, something like that. That they're actually closer to maybe eighty million. Um, that the the numbers are about three times what the documented numbers are. So. In Walla Walla County, we've had what 4,600 documented cases. We may have closer to 13, 14,000 actual infections. So that, again, will help the herd immunity issue. Um, but obviously, vaccinating in addition is going to be massively helpful. But what if the governor might say in a two, three weeks, we're going to phase three, you know, start to open things up. So back to that core question about the Hand washing, distancing, and masking. Is that is it effective? I mean, if even before we get to herd immunity, I guess I just want a statement on the effectiveness of those measures, those those things that everyday people can do, and those ones that are waiting for their vaccine that don't have access yet. How effective are those measures, Dr. Isaacs? Any thoughts on that? Uh, no, I, I don't have a number for you. I know you'd like a, a good number. <laughs> I, I think it's surprising. Um, you know, even in, in households, I believe this is true, uh, that um, uh, where uh, uh, one spouse has been infected, uh, the probability that the other becomes infected is like 50%, uh, but that can be reduced substantially. Uh, and this could be a place where you could get a number uh, with all of those measures in home sequestration. Uh, I don't have a good number for you. Um, I guess, um... Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe I'm beating this one too hard. The the mass and distancing are the most effective conservative measures, more so than cleaning surfaces. Even there, there doesn't seem to be as much transmission that way. Uh, in fact, I, there was an article that just came out this last week, basically saying they don't think food swallowing food transmits the virus at all. Um, you know, it typically rests in your nose. In the back of the throat and you breathe it in so so what you're saying is that if we as a community if we get permission if you will from the governor to go to phase three and we start opening things up more and more by doing the basics we can help keep things under control oh i think absolutely mm -hmm. however i do think there's there's some models ones out of university of washington that says um with the new variants um, we should expect some surge in April to May, no matter what. And so, because we won't be, a, we won't have herd immunity by April or May. It appears that the current vaccines are effective against the new variants, but not everybody's going to have access to them by April or May. And so I do, we're, we're telling our staff that we're not out of the woods yet, but that um, that we should be ready for another surge. I don't think it'll be as large as the others. The, the models are predicting they're not going to be as large as our last couple of surges, but I still think there'll be some increase in, in uh, cases and hospitalizations. Sorry if that's a little depressing. Dr. Hall, the last time we spoke, you talked about vitamin D and its role, and that, that was very interesting. Can you speak to that again? Well, I'm not an expert on vitamin D, but <clears throat> I'm a big believer in just eating healthy and getting outside and doing exercise. So I think there's a lot, there's always a lot of looking at, can you uh, take a vitamin or change your diet and then be protected? I think the most healthy thing, one of the most healthy we can do in Walla Walla County is get outside and get sunlight um, and get uh, fresh air um, and do a nice hand wave at a distance to your fellow hikers or bikers or horseback riders and you know atv riders and whatnot so um it does appear that um modest amounts of vitamin d and sunlight combination does seem to be a little bit protective but i don't think it's a i don't think it's an armor suit against it dr yohanan or dr isaacs you want to contradict that or you disagree or no, no. um i think the, the there is 
I think, reasonable data that uh, that people who have the lowest amount of vitamin D have higher, significantly higher uh, infection or severity rates, um, and that here, particularly in the winter and so forth, there is a, a, a reasonable approach is to make sure that uh, you have a, a good level. A, a supplement is not um, generally a problem, but to talk to your doc and um, make sure you're, uh, you or your family have it. I think that's uh, sensible enough. I take a multivitamin with a vitamin D, with a small amount of vitamin D in it every day. You don't want to overdose. We don't think that there's any evidence that taking large amounts of vitamin D is going to prevent you from getting infected. And large amounts of vitamin D are associated with a lot of other problems like kidney stones. So a multivitamin with the recommended amount, certainly a smart thing to do. You know, when you talk about one thing we haven't talked about yet is herd immunity is is going to be children. And so far, it appears that they've um, inadvertently helped, you know, spread the illness around. Um, they can be asymptomatic carriers, probably more likely than older folks. And um, so there's current um, ongoing trials of the vaccines of multiple different vaccines right now in the United States and across the world. But right now, I think only Pfizer's license for down to 16 and Moderna, I think it's 18. And so we won't know that for some time. I think there's some rules against doing studies in children's on vaccines um, that goes back to the 50, 1950s and 1970s. And so it kind of protects children. You can't start the vaccine trials in children until you prove that it's safe in adults. And so those, those studies have just opened up. Um, but I think it's going to be a while. And that's also going to be a little bit of a reservoir for this illness. And so until we have the kids vaccinated or safe, I think this will continue to circulate in the community. So that's another important point. Although it's great to see the schools opening up and smiles on kids' faces. I've never seen kids so happy out to be practicing soccer out in the 40 degree rain as uh, during the pandemic. Eric, I'd be curious. Oh, go ahead, Dr. Isaac. Eric, I'd be curious about uh, how you're approaching uh, folks that are more um, at risk, the elderly and those that have either autoimmune disorders or other disorders, you know, um, uh, diabetes and so forth, uh, in encouraging them to be uh, particularly attentive to becoming vaccinated. Any, any comment? Well, I think one of the highest risk ones that we've been encouraging um, the the coronavirus attacks folks with elevated levels of, you know, uh, ACE2 receptors. And so I think it's really been attacking a lot of folks with hypertension, obesity, and, and heart disease um, much more. And it's kind of strange. I mean, it's a lot worse than you would think with people with asthma. It's kind of a respiratory disease, but it doesn't affect people as asthma quite as badly as um, folks with hypertension or um, heart disease. And so that in the United States, that is a lot of people. So um, a lot of us, uh, a lot of me <laughs> trying to manage my uh, my mildly high blood pressure. I've probably been a little bit better with my salt intake during a pandemic than I have been in the past year. So, yeah. And Dr. J, did you, did you want to add something to that? Well, from volunteering at the vaccination clinics, it's interesting people who are on some sort of immunosuppressive medication like uh, prednisone or something for ulcerative colitis, they're worried about getting this. And in reality, they're definitely the people who should get it. Um, they cannot get infected from this. I mean, that's that's the, the, the message to them. It's a little piece of normal material RNA, you can't get the infection from it. You know, people who are immune suppressed are maybe at more risk for getting severe infection. So if you're on prednisone, if you're diabetic, or if you're on a, another immunosuppressive, you have, have an immune problem, you definitely want to get the vaccination. And is it, is it your policy as well that people who've had the infection clearly still should get the immunization. Um, it, having the infection gives you some protection, but actually the 
immunization gives you such a more robust protection, presumably not only more thorough, but uh, longer lasting. Great. Yeah, that that's clearly, you know, that that's clearly the case, and that's kind of a surprising finding. You know, when they did their, their original studies, they would they would ch look at antibody levels of people who had had COVID infection, at least moderate level, and then compare them with the doses that they gave in the vaccine. And surprisingly, the vaccine produced higher antibody levels. Uh, it's 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 really amazing. So that's. Um, uh, I, I don't know if that answers. I'm just repeating what you said, Ken. Not really adding anything to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, how many how many doses? How many boosts? How many shots did someone get? Who, someone who had coronavirus. When should they get a vaccine? And how many doses should they get? The the dose question is hasn't been answered. How many doses? I mean, you could make an argument that somebody who could maybe just get one dose, but I haven't seen any national recommendations regarding that, and I would bet, you know, we know that antibody levels stay high, but it, but they're variable depending upon how serious your illness was. Um, so, you know, I'm telling people who ask me, friends who ask me, maybe or people that maybe two, three months after their illness, go ahead and get vaccinated. But I'm not sure there's just any strict data on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've been using a similar number for um, our staff, and so we've been saying that um, they're welcome to get it as soon as they've completely recovered and their immune system's full, fully restored, But so that could be a few weeks after an infection, but we've been telling them for the most part to wait 90 days after an infection. I think the dosing is still the same. I believe the recommendation from the CDC is still the same. It's still two doses of either the Pfizer or the Moderna. And we're all waiting to see what happens with the Johnson and Johnson, which really could change how much we have available. Have, have you run across people who are concerned that there may be side effects to the vaccination we just don't know about? You know, Eric, uh, I've heard that uh, repeatedly. And yet my understanding is from the very long history of vaccination that the CDC has checked this through and essentially long-term side effects uh, show up the longest term or within two months of the vaccination. Now you have to have a slight bit of skepticism if that's you know with a brand new approach but uh, the, 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 the work and the FDA's work of releasing this has been based upon um, that experience and uh, the fact that now that we're months into it that there is no increase in any evidence of long-term side effects. So I think we can start even more and more confidently saying, you know, there's there's really not that problem of long-term side effects. And so no sh minimal short-term and uh, no demonstrated long-term. There's no increase, uh, there's no problem for people who've had like Guillain-Barre syndrome, which had occurred with prior ones having it. And my understanding is that with, um, uh, with auto people with autoimmune disorders, as you were saying, uh, they're the one, they too are ones that really need to get this vaccination. Has anyone seen anybody who's had an, uh, an adverse, uh, an allergic response to it? It's something that's supposed to be what is it, one in a million, one in a hundred thousand, one in a million? I think I last I heard was five per million was the last I heard with Pfizer, and so it, you know it's hard to. It's hard to know. Uh, we've had we've had we've treated some patients throughout our vaccination process, um, but um, you know it's one of those things at a remote location. You want to really be ahead of the curve if you think someone's potentially in anaphylaxis. So we tend to to treat aggressively. Um, but yeah, I I can add to that a little bit. I I think you're right on with the number there, Jake. It's uh, about one in 200,000 anaphylaxis, and it's treatable. We treat it, you know, we got the epinephrine there, and it's treatable. The um, interesting thing about problems with prior vaccinations, um, they typically occurred associated with um, new pandemics, and one of them was the um, I think it was 1976, there was a concern about 
a potentially really deadly flu epidemic and there was a vaccine that was kind of rushed out and, and there was in, increase in Guillain-Barre syndrome cases. What is kind of interesting also is that influenza can be a trigger for Guillain-Barre. So you've got this messy vaccine that's got all these little antigenic components and boom, you did get some interest in or increase in this otherwise rare condition. But uh, these the people in the original vaccine trials that started in July are, are followed weekly for a long period of time, and they're going to be followed out for two years. And now we've had follow up on you know millions of doses and the V Safe program, where that if you register, you get vaccinated. You sign in on the computer and they send you a little notice. Have you had any other problems? And so this is the most heavily scrutinized vaccination ever. And uh, it's it's so clean in terms of what it puts in your body that I think the likelihood of significant um, side effects short term, we know what they are long term, uh, are, is going to be really low. And Ken, you're, you're absolutely right that the Guillain-Barre thing that problems that occurred back in 1976, they occurred within weeks of getting the vaccination. And we already have you know, months worth of data on people. Likely it is really low. I appreciate that you're brave enough to talk about Guillain-Barre to neurologists, Dr. Yahan. <laughs> you're, you're braver than I am. I, I wasn't going to talk about it, so that's smart. Can you know, I one thing you do, you do read about these rare case reports of somebody had a vaccine and something happened, but they're, they seem to be exceedingly rare. And considering the fact that the the we're up to, I don't know, around 25, 30 million doses given total across the country, I think that's the number roughly right now. Um, you know, key, there are going to be just occasional rare events that occur, even if you didn't give them a vaccine when you're talking 25 or 30 million doses. But yeah. Um, I want to put in a plug for Baker Boyer Bank. We talked about adverse reactions and the risk of anaphylaxis, which is extremely rare. Statistically, we shouldn't have you know any cases, potentially no cases, and true cases in Walla Walla, we'll see. But Baker Boyer uh, was able to donate um, EpiPens to, to be distributed at our uh, vaccination clinic. So we thank Baker Boyer for that support. And do you have other questions that have cropped up and you think are important to uh, answer? Well, I'm looking over the list here and it looks like we did a really good job of, of covering all of the questions and all of the categories. And thank you all for, for taking the questions and, and really running with them. Um, I think one would be, what are the best sources of information you as doctors can understand all of the medical terminology and jargon in the best, um, you know, peer-reviewed medical journals that lay people maybe don't understand. And there are a lot of sources of information out there. So what would you say are the best sources of information in lay language for someone interested in learning more about the vaccines or about COVID in general? The CDC has uh, some very good, easy to understand uh, material, and um, it's 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 available for anybody. I absolutely agree. It, it really has all levels of material available uh, for individuals and lay people and families, but also for businesses, and and it has access up to even deeper layers for for scientists and so forth, it's robust. But frankly, our community uh, health care department site is a great place to start because it is nicely done and it leads you uh, to, again, all the information you need and connecting to uh, Washington State Department of Health sites and so forth. So hey, good going. Good job, Dr. Kaminsky. We got just like this this little conference here, I surround myself with good people. I don't, you know, and, and here at the health department, we have really good people. So that's all I've done, surrounded myself with good people. I've been really impressed, just if we're just wrapping up, but um, I think the health department's done a really good job. I know we, it has been actually perfect because there's not a roadmap when a pandemic hits. We have a rough idea what we're going to do, but not a perfect roadmap. But I think particularly the last couple of weeks, the clinics I've seen, really addressing the equity issue. We haven't talked about that. And I think 
I appreciate your staff. We've directed a lot of our patients this way, but you know, being willing to take phone calls and help folks schedule appointments that don't have smartphones or you know can't work a web page very well. Um, so I think that's been great. And I think you also have reserved some of your appointments for um, folks that don't have good access to the internet and whatnot. So good job. Thank you. Now you'll go back to taking mm -hmm. arrows, but. Oh, I can give him some more kudos. I was I was telling Dr. Kaminsky yesterday that it's pretty amazing that he retired and then ran towards public health in the middle of a pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's do you remember what amazing. I said? Do you remember what I said? <laughs> Yes. I forgot to check to see if there was a pandemic before I signed up. <laughs> Next time I'll do that. Jake, we appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, here, here. Is there anything that any of you think we didn't cover that would be helpful to the community at large, businesses in reopening, anything, any stone we need to make sure we turn over before we sign off. I'm just going to encourage everybody to understand we have some ideas of what might be happening in the future, but we don't know exactly how these different components are going to uh, come forth and affect us. So it's just important to continue uh, this uh, kind of event or just make sure that you're staying up to date on what's really happening in our community uh, all the time. It can change. Yeah. And and I think, you know, once this goes out to business leaders and others, they, they'll have individual questions that they uh, want addressed and um, uh, there maybe should be a mechanism for for encouraging people to send those questions in and we, you know, we can we can address them so we're gonna have part two all right sounds <laughs> good town we're, hall but we're town. having it at, on your patio and and you're cooking right <laughs> backyard socially distanced yeah that's right, right. I, um, I guess the message one message i have is uh go back to the for those who haven't been vaccinated or are waiting in line Go back to the basics, the distancing, hand washing, you know, cleaning surfaces and all that masking. <clears throat> and then we've already, you know, Dr. Yaghanen and Isaacs talked a lot about the safety of the vaccine and the effectiveness. So there's a lot. There's something that everybody can do. Yeah. OK, well, thank you all so much. We appreciate your time. <laughs> thank you, Baker Boyer Bank, for putting this together. And I mean, this is a great community service. Yeah. Thank, Thank you for you. supporting us. Yep.